All right, Sync Academy members. So today I actually have Trevor Llewellyn with us. He is one of our um, library partners actually in the syndicate and he is a library owner. He's been running his business for basically about two years now, but he's been in the licensing industry for well over 10 years. So he's been in, in it actually as long as I have. So we've actually gone back quite a ways. We've uh, shared a common um, sort of start in this career and then we kind of went different paths and now we're kind of back together through the syndicate and through Sync Academy here. But this is the best part about Sync Academy is you guys get to ask questions of real professionals working in this business. You guys obviously ask me questions all the time and I answer. But today I wanted to bring Trevor on to really be the expert for this video. And a couple of weeks ago, I posted in the Sync Academy an open question for you guys to comment on. And I said, post any questions that you guys have for a music library owner. What do you wanna know in terms of getting accepted, getting placements, whatever it is you wanna know from the perspective directly of somebody who runs a music library, who goes out and actively pitches the TV, film, and movie clients, what do you really wanna know from them? So today, Trevor was generous enough to uh, give us some of his time, and he's gonna answer every single one of the questions that you guys posted on that post. So thank you guys so much for participating and logging in and making sure that you do uh, actively ask these kind of questions, And because not only are you gonna get your questions answered, but everybody in Sync Academy is gonna get the answers to these uh, questions now, so it's a really cool thing. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first up is from another Trevor uh, in the group, Trevor Wilmot. Um, his question is, I'm about to finish an album of acoustic indie vocal songs with a cinematic orchestral elements that I've created with a few specific libraries in mind. I'm not sure whether I want to go with an exclusive or non-exclusive library and would love some input on the pros and cons. If I go non-exclusive, this would give me the chance to pitch the songs for Song Trader, Music Bed, all those other you know non-exclusive companies out there, and even directly to music supervisors or agents. However, I've heard licensed exclusive libraries tend to get better placements and payouts any thoughts are much appreciated. First off, before uh, this Trevor answers this question, we do have a, I put together an entire presentation on the benefits, pros and cons of exclusive versus non-exclusive in Sync Academy. So there's an actual entire tutorial, I think it's 40 minutes long, dedicated to this one subject. So maybe Trevor you weren't or anybody else watching weren't aware we have that, but definitely after this video, go ahead and take a look at that. But Trevor, go ahead and give us some of your pros and cons about non-exclusive, exclusive in your uh, experience and maybe some insights you can provide for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty biased on this, um, mainly just through not necessarily personal experience, but everybody that I've known that has done non-exclusive, um, they've almost never made as much money as everybody that I've known that has done um, exclusive. Uh, placement wise, you know, like royalty rise, like all of it. So with that type of album too, like <clears throat> the there, there's a pretty big market, a consistent market flow of that kind of stuff to where big libraries are constantly like releasing that kind of stuff, which means there's a, a good uh, demand for it. So <clears throat> with major uh, like exclusive libraries, I could easily see that getting something like that. If it's good enough getting in with a library like that. And I'm, I, in my opinion, I think those will make you more money because, um, and with less work, like once you're done with it and you've delivered it, you can move on to the next project instead of shopping it, doing all the things you might, you know, you might make mistakes with trying to pitch it, you know, like there's all this stuff that you also have to figure out and learn with the non-exclusive thing. Whereas if it's an exclusive, like they're pros, they do it for you. You know, you obviously don't own as much of it and you don't have any of the control, but <clears throat> that's what they do. Like that's why they've been around doing it for so long. And so that's, that's my like basic opinion on it. Um, mainly because, you know, I'm, 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 anybody that I've known that's been really successful in this, they do something and they move on and they just keep rolling through. And so they do a dope album, they get it to a good client and then they move on to the next thing. And that client does all the work from here on out and you don't have to do any extra work and you start making money while you sleep, you know, and getting placements while you sleep. So that's, that's my, uh, yeah, that's my answer on that. But like I said, I don't know many people who have done ex non-exclusives and been like, like quit your day job successful. So, yeah, I'd have to agree with that one. Um, very few people that I've ever come in contact who are doing only non-exclusive stuff are doing it full time. Uh, usually the song trader, music bed, uh, what was the company he said? Yeah, Music Bed. There's a couple others out there. Um, those are usually for people I always suggest that you're just going to dabble in licensing and just kind of throw some tracks out there. And eh, once in a while, maybe you'll get a little bite or something. That's really for the casual observer. But if you want to be serious, you got to have direct relationships. And usually with exclusive libraries, for the most part, you're going to get most of those, um, those relationships built up. So, all right, moving on. We actually have four questions with this next comment. So we're going to do kind of a rapid fire with Trevor here. So right. we'll just do one at a time here. First, can you think of any qualities that your most successful writers have in common? Yeah, um, uh, consistency and hard work. 
like like just and always being there and available and understanding because you know in because music is so different depending on a client whether it's a web series a main show a sports network budgets time everything is all different and fluid being understanding of that is a big deal um fighting on things all the time like i've, I've had writers where they're just like what do you mean you need it in two days or what do you mean it's 50 dollars less than the last thing we did like that it's just i don't want to deal with it we just need to keep moving forward you know Great. Um, and I'm going to keep it going here. So what are the top things you look for in music that's submitted to you? So not necessarily in the writer, but in the tracks. What is the top mm. thing that you really look for? Uh, this is your top thing. So like mixing, uh, like good mixes, um, constant changes. And um, dang, I don't know what the third one would be. Um, just a good amount, I guess. You know, if it's, you know, if, some, if a composer is like, oh, I have like four and I've worked on these for like months, then that tells me that they're not like, they, don't, they just can't pump out a lot of music and that isn't super useful. If the four is really great, then cool. But usually you kind of want, you know, a good amount, good mix and uh, consistent changes. It's not like a four bar loop over and over and over again. Great. And when listening to submissions, is there anything that about a track that would make it an instant no that you would reject right away? Uh, well, the reverse of those other two things, bad mix. And if it's like repetitive, you know, like I hear that same melody over and over and over again, like I'll get like through that melody. If I get that melody and it's making me feel like it's super repetitive, like I won't even go through the rest of it. And it'll just be like, ah, I can't, you know, got to keep going. So those probably bad mix and repetitiveness. Awesome. Uh, this next question, we actually also did a chat. Actually, Trevor, you and I did a chat about the future of the music licensing industry. Um, so let, we'll keep this answer brief. If you guys want to get into a really deep deal, uh, uh, dive into the future of how Trevor and I see the future of the industry, it's a really great chat. It's in the business section of the tutorial, so go check that out. But um, just in a you know 60 second sort of pitch here, where do you see the industry going? Um, upcoming challenges, potential changes to the landscape of the industry, anything like that? Yeah, I, I think that the the cool thing about it is that you know, from when I started, or even from like the early, early 90s, when it all started, and you know, all the library stuff started 80s, 90s, 2000s, and then to now, the platform was kind of the same, you know, it was like libraries, um, licensing, royalties, repeat, you know, now there's so many different chances for so many different types of things through technology, whether whether it's like licensing for VR, or through blockchain, or through TV, or web series, or movies, or well, uh, and, you know, there's just personal blogging, you know, there's so much stuff out there. The The future is actually just kind of what anywhere where you can put music and then add an element of money to it and then figuring it out between like that. So if there's podcasters out there, but they're like crypto podcasters, maybe you set up a way where you license through crypto, you know, like there's just tons of different things you can do now. It's almost an open landscape that you just figure out where you and your music fit. Great. I love the answer. All right. Next up. Uh, this is about the licensing industry becoming uh, a bit more inundated with new people coming on board, submitting to libraries. So the question from Frank here, is the market becoming flooded or are there still plenty of opportunities for new producers to get accepted? And then alongside of that, um, what would be your guess as to the percentage of music that actually gets placed that gets accepted into libraries out there? Now, that's a big general question. It's yeah. really hard to say. But maybe in your experience with libraries you've worked with, maybe with your own, what is the general percentage of tracks that you accept versus the ones that actually have gotten placements? Yeah, so so the first question was um, if it's flooded or not. So it's, I mean, every, every market I feel is flooded and it doesn't, it, that, that doesn't matter. You know, like, I mean, go to the bread aisle. You know, how many pieces, how many types of bread are there? Like, and there's people creating bread companies still, you know, like starting new ones or whatever. So there's 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 room all the, all the time. I don't think there's ever going to be a situation where the market is flooded and you just can't do anything, especially since hard work is probably one of the hardest things to come by. So there's a flood of not so hard workers. And then there's like a, a, another step up and then it's like a much smaller group that's like hard workers. And then one more step up, it's like hardworking and, and good. And, and then it's not flooded in, like at all anymore. And those people really are being that like third tier or whatever. And it's not super hard to be that third tier. You just have to take those two steps, you know? <clears throat> so no, not flooded at all. So second would be, uh, what was the second, the question it was on? Um, uh, how many, what percentage would you guess mm -hmm. have tracks are accepted to get placed? Oh man, it depends on the library. So I've, in, in my past, I've worked with some of the bigger libraries and every single track of mine has placed at some point or another in those big libraries. So whether, you know, I mean, you just name drop them all, you know, you have like the, the, so the Warners and the BMGs and the you know, killer tracks, Megatrix, you know, all those big names. I, in my experience, it's like been hundred percent with the big ones. 
Now, when you once you drop down a little bit to like medium sized or even like beginners like me, uh, the percentage gets rough. You know, like medium sized, maybe like in the fifty percent range. Like beginners like me, maybe you get more in the twenty five percent range. But if they last, they just grow into like for example, um, libraries that I knew that grew that started like maybe three years ago went from placements here and there, here and there to like ninety percent because they survived the like one and a half, two year like gap because there's a lot of libraries that'll survive about a year and then die and you won't hear from them they'll sell the music to a bigger library whatever um once they like go over that gap i'd say you're well over 50 percent once you once they have a few good consistent clients so i love it all right so um when this is from uh, comma uh when contacting a music library if they don't have any information about their submission policies how they want tracks to be submitted should you should a producer do you feel should ask them before sending an email with links or what do you think the best approach is when they don't tell you exactly how they want music to be submitted or that they even do accept submissions uh yes i mean they do they, they need music they're in the business of selling music so they need music now the reason why they make it hard for you is because they don't want to just be bombarded with every you know everybody everywhere like just throwing stuff at them so if you can figure out how to get their email and like email them be super short to the point and just have a link to some of your music and then that's it like don't bug them you know because clearly they don't want to be bugged so if you you just you impress them with your music but you don't you don't send them like don't send them mp3s in the email just do i would you know i I don't know how jesse's uh template exactly looks but you know keep it really short simple here's a link to some of my stuff like hope to hear from you but move on and that from the from the uh, music uh, <clears throat> libraries and also just music people who accept music in general, like supervisors and stuff. I've seen that that's kind of the best when they don't really are. They don't have like a submit here section or anything like that. Just hitting them with something quick and just short and simple is great. And even doing that, like separate it with like three months, like do it one month and then three months later, do it again. You know, that's not really a lot. And to them, that might be like, oh, I remember hearing something, you know, and because they do want to hear it. They just don't want everybody to bombard them. So it makes it a little more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And um, another rapid fire here. We got five questions here. Uh, optimal track length for commercials, TV shows, or film submissions? Um, nothing before two minutes usually. And if it's not a song like an instrumental, I usually don't say go over three. If it's a song, then yeah, go over three because you've got all the sections of a song or whatever. But instrumental, like... There, nobody's gonna sit unless the track is just super enticing or whatever like you know they're not gonna sit through three whole minutes and keep listening so i would say somewhere between two and three great and then of those three which would be commercials tv shows or films which of the three usually has the most frequent placements it's commercials tv or film uh tv like uh, sports and reality have the most frequent Great, I would agree. Uh, is there usually a negotiation for pay or is there a standard flat fee for placed music? So I think they're talking about sync fees. Oh, no, it's it's a negotiation the whole time. Like that's that's half the battle. That's why like, you know, all the different libraries, they have like a sales staff is because that every show, every movie, they all have different budgets. Like, you know, three different shows on the FX network have three completely different budgets. And so, you you, you know, most libraries start with like a base you know, X per track, like sync fee or whatever, but you start to get into negotiation, just like any other like sales business in a way. And they go, oh, well, if you use like five of our tracks, then we'll bump it down to like 750 instead of a thousand or like you just kind of do that. So it it fluctuates like crazy. Great. And BMI or ASCAP, which do you think works best for sync licensing? I mean, technically they both do, but in my experience, BMI has worked way better for sync licensing than ASCAP. And Many of the people that I've known, I think Jesse included, were on ASCAP at one point and switched over to BMI because of the issues that ASCAP has with sync licensing. They they tend to they seem to focus more on radio and major artist type stuff. Yes, hundred percent. I would concur. Get with BMI guys if you're not with BMI. I do recommend it. Um, what is the normal time frame from placement to? Well, there's basically two questions here: to upfront payout and then the royalties. What are those two typically uh, or a range that people can expect from the date they get a placement to when they actually get paid? Mm, it depends. So if you're getting like part of the sync, so like if um, like if the library offers you like fifty percent of a sync fee, then it's usually like. Like so, most libraries that I've worked with, and mine included, if let's say I get a sync, I have like a, a sales schedule or a, a payout schedule. So like four times throughout the year, if a sync comes in in a quarter, then at the end of that quarter, I pay out to all the producers whatever those sinks are. 
Um, so it would be the, the payout would be within that realm. So if they got paid like in January and their payouts are on March, then you get paid in March, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> now the royalties is, is rough because there's, there's factors that go involved with like, let's say you get a placement in a TV show, but some TV shows don't actually turn in their cue sheets until the like final episode. They turn in all the whole season. Some shows turn in at the end of every episode, they turn in your cue sheets. So BMI or ASCAP, you know, maybe you got placed in the first episode. BMI and ASCAP don't get that reported cue sheet until the end of the season, which is like three months later, four months later. So it's the same with like reality show, like a lot of shows do this. And so you maybe got the placement at the beginning of the season in August, but December is when everybody received the cue sheets and now BMI and ASCAP do their processing. And that usually takes like six months. So you may not even see the placement until a year from when it airs or the money from a year, like a year from when it airs. So there's like, I usually say like a six month to a year, if it's domestic, right? So if, you're, if you're, your placement is where you live. Now, if it's a foreign placement, that six months gets like doubled basically because it has to go through their system once and then it goes through the, your PRO system once and then to you. So you, like, you could be looking at like a year and a half after all of that. So it's the royalties is, is really long. The sync fee stuff is a lot quicker um, depending on you know the company's deal. <laughs> Yeah, it's a long-term business, guys. So uh, get get comfortable and just keep working. That's basically your best bet there. Uh, this is one's from Travis. Uh, if fingerprinting, fingerprinting, if you guys don't know, is basically going to be a, it is a technology basically that can recognize the audio waveform of your track so that things can be a little bit more accurately um, uh, tracked instead of just relying on human beings putting together cue sheets. Um, sure. And it's definitely a technology that's going to be coming more and more into the music business as we go forward. If fingerprinting does become the way that placements are identified, what will that do to non-exclusive libraries that might have the same tracks from a fingerprinting perspective, but under different names? So a non-exclusive library might have one track called Cool Track A, but another non-exclusive library has that same track because it's non-exclusive, but that track title has now been called Cool Track B. They have the same audio waveform though, so it's gonna be the same uh, fingerprint. So if this person were setting up a system for tracking placements today, how would they do that? Or alternatively, what is the most broken thing about the current system? Oops, my lost our light there. Yeah, my light turned off. Um, so, okay, so fingerprinting. So there's two different things. So there's actually, um, what, when, when we say fingerprinting, um, there's actually a thing where, and maybe I'm thinking of the wrong term, but there's one, I don't know, fingerprinting, there's, there's fingerprinting and then there's, um, what is the term? Do you, maybe you know what it is, where they put the sound in there. Yeah, I don't remember, oh. but they put like a frequency in there yeah. that yeah, you can't hear. I don't know what that one one's called, but that maybe that is fingerprinting, I think is different. Maybe that, yeah. So either way, there's two separate things that exist right now, which is the Shazam way, right? Where you just kind of, the thing listens and then it hears that song, like track of yours and then it like registers it and goes, oh, this is so-and-so's track. Now, if you've got the non-exclusive library situation going, then that's a big problem and PRs would just won't pay anybody because they're like, well, we don't know who to pay. We're not going to fight you with this. We're not going to try and figure this out. Like we're just... You're, you're we're not going to pay you um they've kind of come up that's what i've heard is that and w when they it's one of the reasons why they haven't implemented it as like a standard because there's so much of that going on plus down the and there was a pma panel on this and another issue that was is um the the data between who owns the music and and the the, the fingerprinting receiving people or whatever like if it's like a company that brent does all this might not be the same, right? Like, like you might sell your, like the catalog might like switch owners or something and whatever might happen, but that doesn't get updated on the other end. And now there's like an issue there too. So there's a lot of issues that have been in, pro in, in place when it comes to the fingerprinting thing. Um, now the other thing, which maybe it is fingerprinting, I'm not sure, but the other thing where they, they, there's another thing that they do where they put a little sound in the music that you can't hear um, that basically is like a barcode almost. So it goes to plays, on a show and then the, the the listening thing doesn't listen to the music at all it just listens for that frequency and then when it plays that frequency then it goes okay that's x and x y and z's track you know they do the and that would be perfect for non-exclusives because that little barcode would be different on the same track because it's not listening to the track it's listening to that little barcode like in the audio that would be good for those situations the only problem is is that from my from what i've heard is that that sound can sometimes cause problems to the music itself and it's not sounding as good um, I could, I mean, I only heard like one test one time, so I, I don't know, but, um, <clears throat> I don't know about that. There's, I mean, there's, plus there's, once that fingerprinting information is like set into the music, you can mess up and like, 
the wrong audio file could end up in the wrong spot and then somebody can get paid, you know, like, so there's a lot of issues with these two things and that's why neither of them have become like standards. Um, so it's, it's just kind of paying attention to this now and seeing where it all goes. And, and, it's, and I don't think either of them will go very far. I don't know how, how to solve some of those other problems. So. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. Absolutely. And um, yeah, that's why cue sheets have just been, that's, that's an interesting point there that they, they do some good things, but they're not perfect solutions. So that's why I'm sure cue sheets have not gone out yet. Um, they still seem to be working the best so far until we have something a little bit better. But um, yeah, yeah, we'll see where the future goes. It'll be kind of interesting. All right. Next up from David, we have two questions here. Um, if we have songs in a non-exclusive library and they haven't been licensed, can we remove them from that library and try to pitch them to an exclusive one? Yeah, I don't see the problem. Um, it, you, I would ask, you know, I would definitely be like, hey, these have been in, you know, Pond5 or whatever, and nothing's happened to them. Is that a problem? Um, if they've been registered, you might have issues there. Um, but yeah, it, it wouldn't be a problem because if they were being licensed for things, like on a reality show or whatever, the moment they take ownership of it, they should also be receiving those royalties and stuff, and it might cause problems. So um, if they haven't been licensed, cool. I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. Right. And I would also just add on there, just always double check with your contracts, because if you signed an agreement, you need to abide by that agreement. So don't ask us for what you should do with your licensing partners. You should ask your licensing partners what you should do with your licensing partners. It's just always better to directly talk to them or just ask them. Uh, it's always a good thing to do. Uh, second part of his question, can a library be both exclusive and non-exclusive? So example, let's say they have a catalog with artist music. That would be their non-exclusive side of it. But they also might have an exclusive side that's just more specific TV, film, production music to pitch exclusively to their clients. Yeah, <laughs> like you just described, like, like I, I do that sometimes, like GID does that sometimes. I think even the, or yeah, I, I, um, I have plenty of companies, I think, that do something like that. So it exists, um, but it would be its own thing. Like the library would be exclusive, but then this other thing would be non-exclusive. Like I don't know any libraries that have some tracks that are exclusive and some that are not, but maybe, maybe I just don't know. But yep. yeah, I don't think so. Absolutely. All right. So next up, this is from Vivido Music Lab. After being accepted by a library, um, what are the steps to become an inner circle guy or gal and how to maintain that ongoing relationship? Now, you guys know that I've said a million times, got to work up, got to show uh, show up, you got to work hard, you got to be consistent, you got to be hungry. Again, like Trevor said before, if there's an opportunity, you don't question it, you don't go, why is it not? Why, why do I only have two days to get this done? You just say, sure, no problem, I will be there. I'll get it done on time. But for you and your in your library, what are the things that you look for that allow you to get somebody that can become a little bit closer to, um, you know, pitching them just more often your custom cues, custom opportunities that maybe not all of your writers get access to? Yeah, I'm a little more inviting than others. Um, I So like, I like to bring people in if I think they're pretty good and then give them a chance and then boot them if they don't really follow through. So, but other libraries are different. They kind of have the like, you really need to impress me before I even like pull you in. And I would say that <clears throat> the, um, one of the things like if, if a library hasn't pulled you in in the inner circle, but you've reached out to them or maybe even like had a couple tracks with them once or twice, which I think is a perfect like first step if you have some tracks with them then just cons be consistent, but not annoying, right? So kind of like what I said before with the like, if, like three months later, hit them up or there's every once in a while, not too often, but every once in a while, just be like, hey, you know, I saw like, like a, a good tactic is to, you know, compliment, compliment, then talk about yourself. You know, be like, hey, I saw the new album, da, da, da. also you got this one placement that was really awesome. I'm excited for you guys. Here's some music, you know, like stuff like that, like, but not too often. I think eventually kind of, you, you stay in their mind and they like, go to you you know I'm, it, like there's just things like that will keep you like and obviously just being good and consistent in general but um i there's been so many times where i've had like a composer and they'll hit me up like, this is pretty good but like we'll see what else they have and then i never hear from them again and then i forget about them and I'm like okay well you know it would have been nice or it would have probably been smart if they would have hit me up like two months later or one month later and been like how are things going here's some new music and that's it i you know they would re-trigger that interest in me you know I can't agree with that more. In fact, that's something that I've been employing lately in my career, even also just with Sync My Music and, and starting to branch out and partner with new people, is if I want to work with somebody, I usually will not on my first attempt try to go um, talk to them and create like a business relationship and say, hey, check me out. Like, let's work together. The first thing I'll do actually is just send them a complimentary email, comment on their YouTube channel, just say, hey, I love what you're doing. You got some really cool stuff. Not ask for anything. I'm not trying to partner with them. There is no sense of like, let's work together. I just want to get into their consciousness and the first thing I want them to think about is that I gave them a nice compliment, I'm paying attention to them, I see what they're doing. So that, and sometimes I do this for people that I don't have any particular plans to work with immediately, 
but I want to open the door. And just by sort of sending a note, sending an email, commenting, just a little quick nothing, or is it a Facebook message, it could be really nothing, it really does um, open up the door. And they go, wow, this is cool, because they know immediately that I'm watching them, I'm interested in what they're doing, I just like what they're doing, and so they just have a positive relationship with me from the top, and I'm not asking for anything. I'm not even trying to partner with them in any business relationship. Now in two or three months, if there's an opportunity or if there's something that I really wanna do with them, now it's a warm open to them. I've already talked to them. I'm not some stranger. I'm not somebody just coming out of the blue saying, hey, let's all work together. Let's do this. Um, it actually puts down their guard quite a bit because it's like, oh, yeah, this is Jesse. He's reached out to He knows what we're doing. He's following us. This is really cool. So it is a really great thing, actually, if you guys want to try doing that before you ever submit to the library you think you want to is send them a little complimentary you know email or a note and just say hey, i just love what you guys are doing it's really cool you do this you do that i love this on your website um, i'm putting together some tracks and maybe i'll throw them your way in a little bit but i just want to let you guys know that i really like what you guys are doing it's a great opener it's really not a bad mm -hmm. idea so i would i definitely would concur with that a, a little pro tip on that too go to any of these libraries social media accounts and see how little engagement and how little people are there like go to any of these libraries like and they like none of them are over like a thousand followers on instagram like none of them have a ton of likes on facebook but they they're updating them you know somebody somewhere in that company is updating these things and there is no engagement which means that there's a ton of people dropping the ball of being in their ear because you you engage with like a post somebody at that company's phone goes off like, the, and nobody else is doing that. Like, there's like, I would go to any of these libraries and there's like, new release and then no comments. And it's, it's like, if I was really trying to get in with all these companies, like, that might be a good place to start. You know, they're not answering emails. Maybe they're, maybe they'll respond on a post, you know, like. It's a new world, absolutely. People live, all, live their lives through their phones, so social media is probably where a lot of their attention is. All right, yeah. next up, uh, same same question or same uh, member here. How can producers know if a library is legit and actually shopping their music consistently without it just sitting on the shelves? Uh, that That's rough. Um, there's a few resources that might exist online. Um, try and find writers who have written for that library. Like if you can find like some of the music and find who those writers are, if they're not like, like for like they don't speak a different language because i'll go to a library sometimes and look at the writers and it'll be like all russian names or something like i don't know any of these people but you know if you can find some you know like ask around or find those people and ask them like hey how how is this working out for you like do a little bit of research if like none of that is around it's rough you know you maybe just email them ask them like how often they update their website you know does it look modern does it look old like when was their new release you know like all that kind of stuff um you know, when, what kind of placement, like they have placements on shows that are going on now, or is their most recent placement survivor, which hasn't existed in a while, like that kind of stuff. Like you just have to kind of try and figure it out for the most part. Cause I've known libraries that have like a really bad website, but, and really no social at all, but get huge placements. So like, it's, it's rough, you know, it says actually no. Yep. I would say, you know, basically one of the other things that I tell people too is just the direct communication. So if a library is talking to you, they have some sort of an online process where they're interacting with you guys, letting you guys know what they're doing, what they're shopping for. Those kind of open lines of communication is always your best bet, is that they actually care about you, they want you to be engaged, they want you to feel like you're part of the team. That's usually the best sign that your tracks are being shopped and considered out there. Um, if they're just saying, uh, you know, go ahead and upload your tracks to our site, you know, through our portal and just create your own little thing and whatever, and they never get back to you, never give you any personalized attention. I can guarantee they're not shopping your music or care really about you staying with them. They're just trying to gather a large number of tracks. So a personal relationship. This is a people business. So having personal relationships. Uh, lastly, from same member, as a library owner in, an, in a perfect world, what's your ideal producer that you would bring on board? Like yeah. business, he's saying business wise. Business wise? Yeah, I think that I kind of touched on this before is like, you know, consistent, you know, isn't going to get too like, isn't going to push back on too much like because of how fluid everything is and obviously high quality, maybe a little bit of a, a little bit of, of a flexibility too. Like some people are really, really good at what they do specifically, but a lot of times clients are gonna ask for like slight adjustments, like, oh, you know, can you make it a little more? And they'll use a weird word like shiny. And then you're like, what does that mean? You gotta figure it out. And like composers who can kind of try and figure that out and adjust their like vision to mold into a little bit of somebody else's vision, that's a big deal because plenty of producers, they just like constantly work on things I'm like, well, I think it's great. I'm not going to have to change it, you know, and that's hard to work with. 
Yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, a couple more questions. We're going to take a little break and then we'll do a part two to this video because this is going to be a long one here. Uh, <laughs> but let's go uh, next up. Mike, he has a question. When's the best time to submit Christmas or holiday music? Um, that's first part. And second part is, is tra uh, trap kind of hip hop sort of a style album, holiday music uh, a thing? Is that something that you could actually see getting placed? Yeah. So the only time not to pitch it is during those holidays. Every, every other time of the year is, is perfect. Don't like, you know, pitch a Christmas album in March or in July, like, but don't pitch it in December or maybe even November, like to cut those out, you know, because that's when all the stuff is getting happened. And that's when most people want to pitch it. So they're just getting bombarded by a bunch of that stuff already. And they already have it like picked from July. So don't do it when the holiday is happening. Every, every other time of the year is fine. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that stuff is growing. What he just described, like trap Christmas or hip hop. That stuff is growing in popularity, especially in advertising and stuff like that. You know, everybody, you, know, you can't just have the same like Christmas, like, like a gener old Christmas song in everything all the time. Um, doing that hybrid type stuff is, is really, really good. Uh, if you do it well, too, because too many people do it really corny, then it's just kind of like, eh. But if you do it well and it's cool, like that'll definitely get your foot in the door because not many people can do holiday and contemporary or holiday and orchestral like well. There you go, guys. All right, so this will be the last one for this video, and then we'll go to part two here. Is there a demand for laid back slash smooth styles of hip hop or trap? Yeah, there's there's a demand for all music in some sort. Like it just depends on. I mean, like look at TV shows, look at movies. Like there are shows that need laid back, chill hip hop. Maybe not every show, maybe not every reality show, but there's. I mean, it, you'd be hard pressed to find the genre that doesn't have some sort of demand. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that Q&A video from our music library partner in Sync Academy. Lots of great questions, and we actually have a second part to the interview. It's actually longer than the first. It's 45 minutes long, and many more questions get asked, and we dive into even deeper topics in terms of how to get accepted, how to stand out with music libraries, how to ensure your tracks are getting placed, how you ensure you're collecting royalties, watching out for red flags, watching out for potential problems out there. So a lot of really fascinating stuff that we get into in the second part video. However, that second part video is only available to Sync Academy members. So if you're a Sync Academy member, you obviously will see the second part right below part one. But if you're not in Sync Academy, you need to sign up for Sync Academy if you'd like to watch that video and get even more insights into how to succeed with music licensing. So I'll put the link below in the description of this video so you can sign up and join us right away. Of course, if you don't know, Sync Academy, not only has that tutorial and that video, but we have 100 plus hours of tutorials for how to produce, mix, and master licensable tracks, tracks that will not collect dust on the shelves of a music library that will actually get accepted and get placed. It's not just enough to get accepted into a library, Getting placements is how you're going to create full-time income for yourself. So if you have very limited time, you've got a couple of hours after work or on the weekends, why try to reinvent the wheel, spinning your wheels, getting halfway through a track, getting stuck, not knowing how to create licensable music that's gonna get used and accepted by libraries, with Sync Academy, you can take all of that guesswork off the table. You can follow in the footsteps of those that have succeeded before you, and we're gonna show you our tips, our tricks, our strategies, our templates, how we do everything that we do to ensure that we start creating income for ourselves with TV, film, music licensing. There is no other academy online even close to this. There are plenty of academies that teach you how to make music, mix music, master music, et cetera, et cetera, get fans, all that other stuff, right? There is nothing else online that's gonna show you how to succeed specifically for TV film sync licensing. That's our one and only focus. And because we only focus on that one side of the music business, we do a really damn good job at making sure that you get everything you need. So not only do you get those tutorials, but you can also post your tracks to get peer review from other members inside the group. We have a feedback corner group, which is wildly popular. There are tracks going up there every single day. It's a very active group. It's not like some of these, I see Facebook groups and other interactive groups. You know, nobody's posted in the last 30 days. It's just, you know, it's a snooze fest. It's a ghost town. Nobody's even showing up and active. Sync Academy is a, is a very active and prolific um, uh, community of really hardworking and talented producers just like you. They're in the same position that you are. Some of them are just learning how to make music for the first time, produce music. Some have been producing music for many years, but never did sync licensing. So there are different, different, uh, many different um, areas that people are in at different steps in their careers, but the same thing is true for across all of them. Even the ones that are doing it full time, they are all there to stay motivated, to stay positive, to stay educated, and to really have the edge on the competition out there to make sure that they are succeeding in this business. So please do join us in Sync Academy. We'd love to have you join our awesome online community.